it's like maybe they're trying to do like a sort of Logan-esque type of thing, no? That was some of the comments, yeah, saying that it was uh, uh, Logan versus Rambo, basically. So they're aye, it doesn't doesn't look great, to be perfectly honest. But I would watch Logan versus Rambo. I would, <laughs> I absolutely would as well. Third one's dedicated to the brave fighters of the Taliban. <laughs> I'm not sure. No, no, it isn't. Yeah, when Bin Laden was the his heel turn. Good morning, Vietnam! I love the smell of night pop in the morning. You're going to need a bigger warning. I feel the need. The need for a speed. Rose, when we're dying, we don't need rose. What's coming? Mr. Wick broke the rules. I trust you understand the repercussions if he survives. John Wick, excommunicado, is now in effect. You shouldn't be here. Nice suit. Good to see you too. Okay, good evening everybody and welcome to Movie Scramble's debut podcast. I am Simmy. Tonight we have Mary. Hey. And our chief editor, editor-in-chief, whatever we want to say it. John, how are you? I'm good. Yeah, good. Um, looking forward to trying this out. It should be a good laugh, if nothing else. So I was going to say, the entertainment value amongst ourselves will be funny. I'm not sure how it's going to translate for everyone else. No, exactly. And to be fair, I'll probably up about an hour before we get cancelled anyway. <laughs> an hour? For me. <laughs> we'll start talking about John Wick 3, and if you haven't seen it, uh, we may be spoiling some bits, so this is your final spoiler warning. But Mary, you went and wrote a review for it on the site. I did. I actually couldn't wait to get home and write it because I have never enjoyed myself that much. Like I thought it was a big step up from the second film. It was so violent, like on a scale that I hadn't even really anticipated because although the films have really beautifully choreographed action sequence, I felt like this took it to another level. But there was much more to it as well. So there was like really nice touches where, for example, the fight in the library where he obviously jams a book in a guy's jaw, but then he like neatly dusts off the blood and put it back on the shelf in the place that it was supposed to be. There was like a lot of really dark humour like that as well. And I just, I thought it was a really strong addition to the franchise. Like I'm always quite wary of films that keep going and going and going, but I actually really enjoyed it and it's making me quite excited for another one to come out. Yeah, well, I'm kind of partial to these films anyway, so I, I obviously really enjoyed it, but it was kind of strange in that when the end of the film came, it was no further forward than the start of the film. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We didn't really, uh, in terms of story, didn't move on. Yeah, there was plenty of action and everything. It was a great movie. I loved it. It was really inventive. Some of this, the the choreography and it was just fantastic. But that, that was my only wee niggle, that it was just kind of, it was almost like a filler. But they'd obviously step things up in terms of how they were going to do it in terms of the action and... So yes, I was I was I was quite impressed by it, and uh, it's just uh, it's very impressive to see a fifty-something-year-old man uh, really up there representing in terms of action movies as well. So yeah, that was good. Well, that was actually going to be my next point regarding that. Obviously, I mean, Keanu Reeves, let's be honest, looks phenomenal for his age. It's a bit like our very own John. There's a portrait of him aging horribly <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> Well, it may actually have been the wall behind me. <laughs> I mean, it's the fact these three films kind of like. Uh... They just follow one after the other. So he's not really had a rest. But that's what I liked about this film. As much as he's some kind of like invincible killer machine, he looked absolutely knackered. Yeah, and I think that's the the sort of reality that you're looking for. And in the review, I actually said that, you know, I think he could rival Tom Cruise for the title of, like, you know, best action like actor or whatever, because they're both kind of the same age and they're now sort of moving into this stage of their career. But actually in the Mission Impossible films, Tom Cruise is a machine. He never seems to not keep going. Whereas at least towards the end of John Wick 3, you did kind of feel like Keanu Reeves' stamina was sort of running out, or at least the characters was. 
that had to do with the story though more than anything else because with the Mission Impossible films especially the last one there's an action scene and then the move like for instance I, I was actually just starting watching it again there and uh, it was the first scene that's set in Belfast and then mm -hmm. it goes Berlin and then Paris and whatever so uh, they, they, they jump about whereas like Sammy said there uh, John Wick 3 starts 10 minutes after John Wick 2 finishes. Yeah. So he finishes running and he starts running. So he's going to be knackered yeah. all the way through it. But yes, you can really tell that uh, it does get a bit of a slog. And if you think about it, the first hour of that film is just wall to wall action. Yeah. It's just fighting his way across New York. So yeah, it doesn't actually take a break for, well, I mean, the first break it really takes is when he, he meets up with Angelica Houston. And that's more of a, almost like a, an exposition dump there and the, it kind of slows down but before that it's just man you know it's everything knives class yeah. horses you know everything i know and i did really like that they kind of threw everything at it the only sequence i would say that was kind of felt weaker for me was actually when they introduced tally berry's character i felt like the film really slowed down then and not in a way that kind of was pleasing and sort of allowed you to sort of catch your breath I kind of felt like I was losing interest even when they had that massive fight in uh, the bazaar I just it didn't really do anything for me it didn't really add anything to the film and I kind of almost wish they had sort of left it out a wee bit which is terrible but it was the weakest part of the film for me Who's the actor that was in that uh, in that scene with Halle Berry, the guy who gave my thrones? Oh Jerome Flynn I said Jerome, Jerome, Jerome. Jerome. Sitting watching Soldier Soldier somebody says to you See that guy, by the way, he's going to be a massive actor one day. Yeah. <laughs> well, what's in yep. my head is, remember they did a cover of Unchained Melody that Simon Cowell had arranged for them? That's what's in my head when I see him. Yeah, <laughs> same, yeah. The funny fact funny. that it was him and uh, uh, Robson Green, who now yeah. does fly fishing programmes. Yeah. You know, it's just it's bizarre. Absolutely and the bizarre. Thing is, when you watch Robson Green doing any fly fishing programmes, he was the one that made it at the two of them. I know, I know. <laughs> What was that supposed to be? No idea. That's yeah. why I was asking. Well, I liked it because it was uh, like bad guy comico, you know. Yeah, it was like that generic racist film accent that everyone has, <laughs> and they're, they're not sure where they're supposed to be from, but they're like the exotic bad guy. Uh, he's clearly a bad guy, so we'll give him an accent. It could be Russian, could be German. We're not really too sure if it's Middle Eastern, but. <laughs> I kind of felt like maybe he was meant to be sort of Russian or something because they'd made the link, like just obviously in the scenes before with Angelica Houston, I thought, oh, maybe. But then the more he spoke, I was like, he actually can't control his own accent. They should probably have given him a non-speaking part. <laughs> <laughs> Can we at least overdub it, you know? Uh -huh, with somebody who's actually Russian or whatever he was supposed to be. That is a actually a big question mark. I have no idea what the answer to that is. That's good. But if anybody's uh, listening, just please uh, contact at Movies Gramble on Twitter and uh, give us your thoughts on what you think Jerome Flynn's accent was in John Wick 3. <laughs> Another thing I absolutely kind of love about John Wick, though, is that he'd make Shane in these films. Oh, he is, like, weirdly sexy. I'm just floating that out there. He is like weirdly sexy in these films, like even more so than Keanu Reeves. No, I kind of get that. He's somebody who's aged particularly well, definitely. And if you think about it, for a whole generation of people, he is Lovejoy. So it's the same idea as Jerome Flynn. So yeah. these guys are having sort of career renaissance as they're getting older, especially. I mean, look at the, the kind of thing that Ian McShane's been doing since he obviously moved over to America. Yeah. And things like Deadwood and he's mm. in American Gods and he seems to pop yeah. up in all sorts of stuff. I don't know if you ever seen Sexy Beast. It's a gangland boss in that and he's so creepy. In fact, I would just recommend seeing Sexy Beast because it's just all round, it's a fantastic movie. But yeah, he's particularly good in that. And that was one of the sort of the early roles that he took on after uh, yeah. doing Love Joy for about a decade or something, you know. So I mean I like good. I like his character in the sense that he's quite ambiguous. Like you never really know kind of where he stands with John Wick. You're never really sure where his loyalties lie, other than to himself, obviously. But I really like his character as well. I read uh, a review, no, not a review, it was an interview with um, Ian McShane. And he was talking about his character and how between him and the, the guy that's the concierge, whose name mm -hmm. alludes to me at the moment, uh, between them, they come up with a whole backstory about how they met in the 60s. And like a, like the, it was like the, 
one of the Central African Republics and Ian McShane at the time was working for the SAS or something. Really? And they come up with this whole yeah, they come up with this whole backstory about how they kind of came together and uh, they actually formed this sort of bond. And obviously that you can see that especially in the third film when the way that they interact and the way that they get involved yeah. more with the action, again without really giving anything away. Yeah, no, I like the character of the concierge because it could have been one of those characters that was just totally secondary. But I, I, I agree with you. I think the character really came into his own in the third film in particular, and there was more of a dynamic between the two of them. But I just like the sort of, he is that sort of typical kind of, you know, stiff concierge type character. But at the same time, he obviously knows his way around a, a gun or two. <laughs> yeah, and a dog, obviously. You know. Yeah, all oh, the dogs. <laughs> How can we not mention the dogs? That's true. Halle Berry had some truly scary dogs in this film. That's the only thing in this film that made me jump. Like I have no issues with people getting bits sliced off or axes thrown at them, but those two Alsatians, I could not bear. They were so violent. <laughs> I mean, how do you train a dog to do that? That's what my, you know, do you just like crotch at it quite a lot and then just let them go? Yeah, there was a lot of guys getting their balls bitten. I was like, the stuntmen must have made some serious money for this because there was just like savaged balls everywhere for a few of the scenes. I know, and I, I don't want to speak for the entire mankind, but that's you didn't get desensitised by each bite. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it wasn't a kind of case you're like, right, I'm kind of just bored of it now. I, was like, nah, I can still feel that. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> there was a few leg crosses going on in the cinema, actually, when that kept happening. It was interesting to see reactions. <laughs> well, I kind of thought about the Unsullied at that moment in time from <laughs> Game of Thrones because, you know, they, they were already there, so it, it would have meant nothing to them, uh, a dog attacking them in that particular area, so... <laughs> She doesn't really do anything for me as an actress. I can't think of a film that I've seen her and gone, my God, that was outstanding. I can't really think of anything. You're not a Catwoman fan then. <laughs> <laughs> I thought she was pretty good in uh, the second Kingsman film. Yeah. Oh, I haven't actually seen that. Like, it seemed to just pass me by. I think it got a few bad reviews when it opened. And to be fair, when I saw the trailers at first, I kind of felt like it was a remake. I saw a sequel for the sake of making a sequel. Um, but I don't actually know too much about it. It's not a great film, to be fair. It's nowhere near as good as the first one. Which is a shame, because the first one was outstanding. Like It was so different and unexpected, and it just mm. it ticked a lot of boxes that I wasn't even aware that I was looking for in a film, but I really enjoyed it. So that's a shame that the second one was weak. Apparently they're making a sequel to that as well, but they're also wanting to do like a spin-off, or sorry, shared universe. They've already started it. They're doing a... The, the third Kingsman film is... Uh, being filmed just now. Matthew Vaughn was speaking in a podcast about something else. Oh, he was speaking about Rocket Man. Mm -hmm. oh. Basically, he's doing that uh, because obviously it's his company that's producing it. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's also doing the Kingsman prequel. I think it's Ray Fiennes in it. It's set like sort of uh, late 19th century, early 20th century. And it's sort of the the origins of the whole Taylor thing and the whole mm -hmm. Kings and how they all sort of come into being. So. Oh, that might be quite interesting. The only um, thing is that Ray Fiennes um, only ever acts with his teeth. <laughs> like, nothing else on his face moves. You just see the teeth moving. And the thing is, I've got a lot of love for Ray Fiennes. Like, he's great in Schindler's List. He's great in... Um, Grand Budapest Hotel, but I've I've never seen an MD who only literally moves their teeth. Nothing else moves. And if you actually study him for long enough, particularly in the Bond films, you really notice it and you can't help becoming aware that, oh, there's the bottom set going again. Now it's the top set. It's really weird. He must have loved uh, playing Voldemort then because he's got no lips. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's just all teeth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and obviously the English patient as well. Where, you know, he didn't really move anything there, did he? <laughs> Actually, what I was going to bring up was, since we're speaking of action stars who are sort of having a wee bit of a renaissance in later life, so have you seen the uproar around the Mel Gibson Rothschild film? No. Nope. So nope. Mel Gibson, who obviously is kind of having a career comeback with like Bloodfather and also directing Hacksaw Ridge and stuff like that, is in big trouble again because apparently he's in a satire about the Rothschilds, which are obviously a massive um, banking family who happen to be Jewish, but it's a satire about Jewish banking. Like, yeah. who thought that was a good idea in Mel's camp? He seems to be cast these days and uh, it's always controversy no matter what he's doing because he was cast and uh, dragged across, across concrete yep. and he was basically like this older 
uh, sort of mildly racist cop in that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the cast that you could tell that the casting was done for that very reason. Now, he was very good done it. Mm -hmm. Um, he's, he's still, a bit, despite everything that he's obviously said and done, he does produce the goods on screen. He's mm -hmm. still very good, but uh, yeah, he does come with all this baggage. So every single role that he takes on is scrutinised to the sort of nth degree. Yeah. Well, I actually really enjoyed him in Bloodfather. I thought that was a nice sort of kind of homage to sort of 80s kind of or like even like B-movie style action movies. I thought that was really enjoyable. And again, he is somebody who obviously had all this stuff not happened previously, probably would be having the same type of career as maybe Liam Neeson's happened just now. Um, it's just obviously there's, as you say, a whole bunch of baggage attached to whatever he does. The same amount of baggage attached to Liam Neeson now, obviously, after his most recent comments. <laughs> That's a fair point. I actually think he's making a case of like, we've got a uh, script called Taken. Who do you want to be in it? Mel Gibson, see up to these days? Well... Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, Mel's tried a few different things, obviously. He was in, was it, was it Daddy's Home 2? Yep. Yeah, he was in that as well. And that's a sort of, that was a comedic role sort of riffing on almost his Lethal Weapon persona, like the later sort of Lethal mm -hmm. Weapon films and stuff mm -hmm. as well. But yeah, I mean, if you think about some of these guys, the the way that they've, their career uh, progressed and they got so high and then they obviously just uh, pretty much to a man decided that, right, oh, I need to diversify. I need to do comedy. I need to do more sort of serious yeah action or more serious drama or whatever and uh, it I think never with, works out well i think with tom like i think tom it's worked out for tom cruise but i think that was like a really you know that was a well thought out career decision because you know he was the sort of pretty boy you know the pinup boy in the 80s and stuff like that and he obviously sort of you know sensibly realized that that was never going to last forever so he had to move into something where he could still you know be a regular box office feature and I think he's maybe with Keanu Reeves they've probably been the ones that have transitioned most successfully of I mean Liam Neeson I suppose up until obviously recently in recent comments and stuff like that but I think they're probably the best examples of action stars or maybe Stallone because obviously you know Rocky Balboa and the Creed films are still doing well mm -hmm. yeah, yeah it's a good point I mean I can't forget how it's been 20, 23 years since uh, the Mission Impossible films have spanned. Really? Yeah, yeah. it was 96 was the first one. I mean, there's only six of, six of them. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Weird because there's been about 17 Saw films in that time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. I mean, did you see the last Saw film? Ah, it was awful. Oh, yeah, it was terrible. Yeah. <laughs> it was just really, really bad. <laughs> and, uh, I've got a very low tolerance, you know, sorry, a very high tolerance, as you say, for, for watching real rubbish. But that was just, you know, I, I was actually rooting for some of the mechanical devices at <laughs> you know, certain points. <laughs> it's never, again, this is a, a franchise that's totally passed me by. It's never been one that sort of, I think because it probably, when they first started coming out, there was probably like a whole bunch of sort of torture porn stuff coming up at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that's never been my bag. Like, I don't mind like the violence that's in like, so the John Wick films and stuff like that, because it seems kind of justified within the context of the film. But, you know, gratuitous violence for just the sake of it is, it just doesn't appeal to me at all. Well, see the first saw film, it's absolutely brilliant. And it's got a very kind of seven vibe to it. Mm -hmm. You know, it could almost it could almost exist in the same universe. You know, I think the problem with these types of films is though it was like the Paranormal Activity films. See, as soon as somebody somewhere works out they can make a shit ton of money, the quality just absolutely evaporates. It's, it's no longer about producing good cinema. It's like how much how much longer can we keep this franchise going? You know, how much money are we going to make out of it? Well, Paranormal Activity is a good point because when you watch the first film, although you know it's no real. Mm -hmm. You watch it and go, it could be real. Yeah, because it was marketed so well. It literally mm -hmm. had no marketing campaign, which actually is the most successful marketing campaign there's ever been in recent cinema because everyone went into it going, I'm not really too sure what this is about. And although found footage has obviously been done before, yeah. I think it was a quite refreshing update of it. Um, it was scary. It was, you know, and obviously it had real like jump scares and stuff like that. But the second one, the quality dipped really quickly as well. And it just... Yeah, I think they're on what Paranormal Activity four now. No idea. Right? I think it's called the Ghost Dimension. No, it's more than that. It's like six or something. And oh, really? In for the bit of first one, you're watching it. Do you watch them, John? I. Well, this is my confession time. I've never seen any of them. This could be like a found footage film. It is mm -hmm. done really well. By the last one, they actually travel in another dimension and travel back in time. And I'm like, okay, kind of stretching believability here, but I'll go above it, and it's awful. 
That that's sounds that's absolutely terrible. Terrible. They're a spin off as well. And John Wick's getting a TV series spin off, is that right? Yeah, the Continental. It's been been getting talked about for maybe about two years. It's in fact since the the second film. Uh, they've been talking about it, and obviously it's going to be sort of tales based around that. But obviously they're they've now in the third film expanded it, so you've got not just the continental in Rome, you've got mm-hmm. the possibility of them all over the world, basically. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah. I, I think that'd be quite interesting. But again, yeah. they would need to do it well. Hmm. Depends on <laughs> what networks thinking of doing it. I'm not honestly sure. I just know that they said that they were they were confirming that there would be a TV series. Um, I just wondered if it would be a sort of, is it going to be like, you know, there's going to be some cast from the film transferred over to TV, or is this going to be a sort of almost completely separate entity um, that does focus more on maybe origin stories or something as opposed to, like, there's not too much information about it, but mm-hmm. I just, I do get the fear with things like this as well, because there's so many cases where, you know, TV channels or studios or whatever jump on something that's done really well at cinema again and it doesn't really work out because it's it's meant to be a sort of one-off event as opposed to a 12-part series. See, that was my concern with the John Wick films in general because I'm kind of like, but how long can they... Yeah, I think if they're smart about it, like all good franchises or whatever, like as we saw with the end of an era or various ends of eras within Avengers, like I think you know when to end it. That's the clever thing, is to know when to walk away from it. I think the the people involved in it have enough about them that they they won't keep it going for too long. Mm-hmm. Just because I think there's there's it's like a real sort of team effort. So if say the director goes, or if Keanu Reeves decides that he's had enough, then mm-hmm. uh, I don't think it will go much longer past that. They may try. I mean, always what happens is they reboot these things, you know, and it'll be like his lost son or something, you know, that nobody ever knew about or something like that, you know. Or, because they didn't exist up until yeah. he used to make money. <laughs> maybe, a, maybe a story about the dogs or something, I don't know. You know, there's all sorts of things they can do. And we've seen it in the past, but I think they're quite precious about it. So I don't think they're really going to uh, do, like, loads and loads of it. But apparently the third film uh, grossed something like 87% more than the second film. Ah, and that's why the fourth film was announced two so days then, after the, yeah. the third film actually came out. So, I mean, look at the body count in this film, but there wasn't really any sort of body count in terms of certain people uh-huh. in the film. You know, I'm trying not to yeah. uh, go into any great detail here, but yeah, it, it was fairly obvious, especially when you get to the. I mean, this was over two hours, this film, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So when you get to the, this, a certain point in the film and you kind of go I think we're going for more here yeah. I really do <laughs> and they've already killed the like end. 80 people <laughs> by yeah. that point I like the introduction of Asia Kate Dillon's character the adjudicator because I'm a big fan of the character of Taylor in Billions so it was interesting to see them brought into this universe but I think they're a really good actor um, and I thought that was an interesting addition to the franchise as well it's kind of about just expanding that world isn't it the mm-hmm. We kind of got a glimpse in the first film and with each one we're kind of getting more and more. I mean, if I'm talking about things I didn't think worked, when he goes to meet the kind of head honcho of the table. Mm-hmm. You don't like it? I just don't think it worked. There was no need for it. Uh, it obviously, it was all set up with some, you know, you know, I need to go to Casablanca and you're kind mm-hmm. of like, okay, right, have you not got enough? resources in New York, you know, you could probably call upon. But yes, they had to go to Casablanca and then that just led to the the big, the money shot in the desert, you know, walking over the dunes and all this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. It was was unnecessary. Yeah, I think again, but it was part of that that whole sequence in Casablanca that I just think didn't really add anything other than I was just thinking how is his suit still so perfect after all of this like he's trawling through the desert he's really sweaty and covered in blood and yet he just looked pristine by the end of it I was pretty impressed it's just that piano glow yeah Yeah, I think think it's his inner goodness just keeping that suit alive it's the tactical lining as well obviously in the suit that obviously helps (laughs) (laughs) but did you notice there was one thing I noticed that when uh, and, and it sort of spans all of the films Whenever Keanu is being chased, he's always wearing a suit and a white shirt. Mm-hmm. So he's the good guy. But when he's on the offensive, it's a suit with a black shirt. 
Oh. He changes into a black shirt when he's going going up against these guys. When they went up against the uh, the sort of main baddie in the second film, black shirt black on. Shirt. When he met when he was at uh, in the desert with a high table and they gave him the new suit, mm-hmm. black shirt again. Black shirt. Do you know it's interesting because in my review, I compared the suit to the suit of Cary Grant in North by Northwest purely because I couldn't work out who he kept it so perfectly as well. But actually, it's interesting that you say that because Cary Grant obviously has a white shirt on and he is the guy being pursued in that film mm-hmm. as well. So that's interesting. Yeah, I bit credit Keanu as well that a guy with a career like he's had and played so many characters, he could easily be pigeonholed and stereotyped. Mm-hmm. He's known for off the top of my head three four iconic characters ted for will and ted you get the uh, neo in the matrix yep. point break now john wick is yes. yep. and he's in one of my favorite films like of all time which is the devil's advocate i thought you were going to say parenthood <laughs> <laughs> the lake house <laughs> for for all the films that he's good in he's in an awful lot of stuff that's absolutely rubbish as well though he yeah. He has had a, a bit of a patchy track record, which if you look at most uh, Hollywood stars, they're exactly the same, but some of his have been really bad. I saw one of his called uh, Siberia. Mm-hmm. It's on Netflix just now, and I saw that just before Christmas, and it's uh, he's a, a diamond trader in it. And it's part of it's based in Siberia, and it's trying to sort of play in the sort of the John Wick kind of thing a wee bit. Mm-hmm. There's a bit of action in it, and uh, they obviously didn't know what to do with him for part of it. So there's two extended sex scenes in it, <laughs> just because you get to see him taking his clothes off and having a bit of a uh, a bit a bit of gentleman's relief, shall we say? <laughs> <laughs> so, and you think the first time you think, okay, yeah, yeah. It's very well shot, it's very moody and everything. But then <laughs> about 30 minutes later that he's doing it again, you're going, come on, really? <laughs> I mean, I see Keanu Reeves' sex scenes and I raise you, I have watched um, Assassin and, is it Bloodshot with Danny Dyer, in which he gratuitously gets his kit off. But weirdly enough, not his boxers, which look like really unwashed and gross. And he just <laughs> grunts his way under the covers for a couple of sex scenes. It's awful. <laughs> Oh, he's another one that's uh, got a problematic personal life as well, or he, he did have for a long time with uh, some of the, the comments he was coming out with about sort of, you know, if your girlfriend leaves, you just slash her and stuff like that. He, was, he said about that in a, it was a newspaper column or something, was it? was that a, a lad's mag in, column? In the lad's mag, and it was some kind of yeah. agony uncle type thing. Uh, yeah. he, he went a bit nuts. <laughs> he kind of forgot it wasn't a film. I mean, I can't think of a stage in my life where I would ever have to consult Danny Dyer to help me make things better. But okay. Well, he could do. We could do a lot worse than asking him with the current state of things. I think at the moment. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I think it's safe to say with John Wick. Then that's three recommends all round. Oh yeah, definitely. Absolutely yes. It's just it's a good fun popcorn film that you don't have to think too much during but it's actually really enjoyable mm-hmm. yeah yep. so uh, i totally agree with that yeah all of this for what because of a puppy wasn't just a puppy do you think the action stars making a bit of a comeback or do you think yeah. it ever went away I don't think it ever went away. I just think like it's like what you guys were saying earlier. Like there is this kind of renaissance of actors who were really big, but in a slightly different capacity, maybe in the eighties that are now coming back and doing just pure action films. But I don't think the action genre has ever really gone away. Like I just think that maybe there was a sort of dip in quality and now maybe that these guys who have a little bit of credence and a little bit of star power and maybe some they can make, you know decisions as producers like the quality's maybe improving again Mm -hmm. and having said that we obviously just talked about the rambo last blood trailer and that looks like a pile of gash it does but i'm still going to go and see it because i love rambo one of these franchises that you end up just watching them all anyway isn't it so Mm -hmm. it's fair. this is only the fifth one it's no like it's not like Predator or something. We're on like the twentieth film or something. <laughs> I don't. I don't count Alien versus Predator in that uh, series. And the last one was just. I, I was so disappointed. Do you know it was odd because I had high hopes for that as well because Shane Black obviously was involved in what writing or directing, and mm. then it was just a big pile of crap. It was a shame, yeah. That the potential was there for doing something really special with it, and it just 
it just didn't deliver, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, you could never make Predator the way it was made the first time around because obviously there's a lot of like you know misogyny and um, slightly racist or whatever comments from some of the characters. So it is of its time. It's a little homophobic as well. <laughs> yeah, well, there's that as well. But it's one of those things where it's like I'm not looking for an exact replica. But I'm just looking for something that's of that level that it's kind of fun and it's you know a lot of stunt work and a lot of but they always seem to miss the mark with these films I think mm. I think it's interesting I mean, the first Predator film though and you've got like uh, Arnie, Jesse Ventura Carl Weathers, all these massive guys, bodybuilder type looking like uh, Adonis's sculpted out of granite and for the second one, they bring in Danny Glover. <laughs> <laughs> he looks like an old man. This is like post lethal weapon, where he's playing the entire film series telling us he's, he's close to retirement. <laughs> <laughs> throw him against a fucking predator. <laughs> <laughs> and they expect us to believe it. And don't get me wrong, I actually like Predator too. You know, I mean, I like it for all its faults, but come off it. It's interesting though, because I actually think there's no sort of, not to be ageist, young action stars i think it definitely is this wave of older actors who are sort of coming back when you think of people who've tried to maybe sort of establish themselves as kind of action stars it's there's nobody i can really think of that sort of springs to mind that you would go oh definitely he'll do really well or she'll do really well and they'll have loads of films behind them i can't really think of anyone offhand i think mean, when i was thinking of, kind of the new action star was there so much kind of like guys that have kind of like came in a comeback where it'd be like John, oh, I mean, Kennedy's was Kennedy did it in the Matrix and stuff like that, but it wasn't you know, mm-hmm. like, John Wick's a different action hero. Mm-hmm. Um, Liam Neeson had a kind of second uh, career as an action star and stuff. Mm-hmm. Guys like The Rock, the new wave of action stars, mm-hmm. you know, like I mean, The Rock looks like it could have been an action star in any decade. Yeah. Jason Statham, you know, things like that. And Idris Elba's even kind of getting out of that mold a wee bit. It's because Jason Statham stars in classic films such as The Meg. Oh, well. Everybody's but, got a wee blemish in the record. <laughs> but these guys came from sort of other mediums, if you like, with The Rock. He obviously came from wrestling. He made mm-hmm. his name there and he used that. And uh, I've, I've got nothing but admiration for the guy because if you look at some of the early films that he was in, he he was in films that he wasn't necessarily the star and he was able to sort of develop his acting as well now. He's acting for what it is. I think he's he's a movie star, and he's a very good movie star. But um, he is one of these guys that had a career path and followed. And Jason Statham was the same. He mm-hmm. started off. He was a he was a diver, wasn't he? Yeah, he, he was on the British a, Olympics a, team. Yeah. Yeah. So he started off that way, and obviously uh, developed his physique from there. And then again, it was quite small roles to begin with. I mean, it was was it Lockstock was this sort of I breakout? Yeah, yeah. I think it was I. Yeah, so he was in that and then obviously developed himself from there and obviously went into the like, Transporter film. So it's these guys, aren't they're, they're, they weren't movie stars first, they were athletes first and they used yeah. their athleticism and then learned to be movie stars. Whereas the likes of the older ones, the likes of Stallone, or not so much Schwarzenegger, obviously because he mm-hmm. came from the same sort of world, but they were actors who became action stars rather than the other yeah. way about. That's a fair That's point. True. That's true. And I guess um, like John Cena is obviously attempting to do the same thing, maybe perhaps inspired by what um, The Rock has done. Definitely. Definitely. He's got that kind of crossover appeal. Yeah, like, so he popped up in Daddy's Home too, as well, towards the end. I just think that... Um, Spoilers guess, for Daddy's Home too, obviously. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that too. I guess you just need to be sort of careful because, like, <laughs> like Keanu Reeves obviously is an actor and what he brings to John Wick is somebody with an actor's background, whereas somebody whose craft has been their physique maybe doesn't bring the same things to a role. And I don't ever want films to lose the fact that you are supposed to be entertained by the acting as mm-hmm. well as impressed by somebody's physical prowess. That's a fair point. I mean, when you think of a guy like The Rock, though, it just it was just charisma. Yeah, he's like a he's like a really charming guy. And when you think of the stuff like as John was saying, you know, he started off doing stuff like the Tooth Fairy and all this, and it was just crap. But it was crap that he needed to do in order to work on his you know abilities. Speaking of his earlier films, actually, you know, I was flicking through Now TV the other night, and the Scorpion King Five was on it. What? <laughs> 
<laughs> like, you didn't tell us. And I'm sitting going, there's a market for the Scorpion King films. I totally passed, this passed me by. Yeah, I had, I mean, I knew there was the one film, but I didn't know that had spawned a whole universe or whatever of Scorpion King films. My God. You know the Scorpion King's a prequel to The Mummy? Yeah. yeah. I think the Scorpion King 2 is a prequel to The Scorpion King. <laughs> I'm not too sure if this trend continues in the Scorpion King 5 is... <laughs> It's in so far back, yeah, he's like just yeah. out the womb. Do you know who could have been like this? Is an interesting point. So, see somebody like Jerry Butler, who was launched purely as an action star in 300. What's happened to his career? He was in that film recently, The Lighthouse, which apparently is really good, but I've not seen it yet. He is, is really good in that, yeah. I saw that a couple of months ago. It's uh, changed its name to The Vanishing mm-hmm. just to confuse it with the other film, it was called The Vanishing, the yeah, which is Dutch about- film. Yeah. yeah, uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Not to confuse it with that other film called The Lighthouse, which I keep seeing <laughs> and thinking it's that. Yeah. He is he's really good in uh, that lighthouse film. He's very, very good and it's a very understated performance as well. He he doesn't go away. Gerard Butler just goes on and on and on in terms of <laughs> the action films are all fairly similar. What was that one he was in uh last year? He was like a Eelstorm. No, the the one before that, it was a dirty cop. Oh. Den of thieves. Yeah. Yes, yes, that one. Now that was a tremendously awful film, but it but was enjoyable. Entertaining. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and he it doesn't. I don't think he really cares. And he's got the new one. Is it um, Angel Has Fallen? Yeah, the third of the Has oh, no Fallen way. trilogy. I yeah, so that was, was that a Has just... Fallen trilogy. This is awesome. I love yep. I love those films. Oh Sorry, God. I'm still not over John saying gentleman relief earlier. That is going to haunt me for the rest of my life. Yeah, don't uh, Google it. <laughs> <laughs> it. It can either make or break your evening. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> kind of a cologne, doesn't it? Gentleman's <laughs> <laughs> relief for men. No, it's bad to say. Alan Cummings' self-titled cologne that he released. The joking. Nope, it's called Cumming. Oh. Well. <laughs> Can you imagine being in work, like in an office, and somebody's like, oh, that smells really nice. What are you wearing? Oh, coming. Yeah, put some on me. <laughs> Does it smell of the sea? Excuse me. <laughs> <Christ. laughs> well, thanks for listening to our first ever Movie Scramble podcast. It's been a long time Badger and John to do. <laughs> yeah, much, yeah. Rented after getting them um, steaming last Friday. So... <laughs> I think he woke up on Saturday like, what did I agree to again? Oh, no. But thanks very much. If you like the podcast, uh, subscribe, give us a like, let us know in the comments what you'd like to see in future. But you can uh, follow us on all the usual social media channels, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and it's so at Movie Scramble. And obviously check out the website itself. That's moviescramble.co.uk. Thank you. And bye for now. Do you expect him to make it out? A $14 million bounty on his head. And everyone in the city wants a piece of it. I say the odds are about even. Dark, five seconds. John Wick, excommunicado, in effect, in three, two, one. And away we go.